Well, first, I want to thank all of you for coming today, and also thanks to everyone who's watching over the live stream. We're here to talk about the state of our university, the progress we've made over the past year, the successes we've had, and the challenges that remain in the future. We have much to celebrate, and the future looks very bright, though we have much to do if we are to realize our potential. Before I begin, I want to note two things. First, tomorrow is Veterans Day. Uh, we have a strong tradition of military service at the U of I. Earlier today, I was fortunate to participate in a wreath-laying ceremony at Memorial Gym to honor those vandals who, who have given their lives in service to our country. And thanks especially to Dan Button for his role in that, in that ceremony. But I'd like to ask our veterans, our men and women uh, who have served, to please stand and be recognized. So any veteran or active duty <laughs> member. Thanks very much. We all appreciate your service. Second, I want to acknowledge the distraction that I caused in the past couple weeks as a candidate at another institution. I don't want to spend much time on that today, except to say that this university is the work of many people, not one. Any distraction from our success and from your hard work, I regret. I don't want anyone to take away from our, accompli uh, from our accomplishments or from a serious examination of the work ahead. As we celebrate the year's progress and look ahead, I'll organize this discussion around our strategic plan, which I think is a very strong one. And you can find additional detail on progress in our revised plan and in our 2017 annual report. I'd like to begin with a quick video review of the year. This video touches on some of the specific successes we've had, and the annual report also highlights areas of significant achievement. Copies of the annual report and the revised plan are available in this room and in many other locations. But let's take a look at the video. The University of Idaho is a unique place. As a national land-grant research university, we are responsible for changing lives, driving innovation and discovery, and building prosperous communities within Idaho. We're growing enrollment, collaborating with the State Board of Education on admissions, investing in research programs to engage students in new ways, and tailoring recruitment strategies. Our Global Student Success Center and expanded Western Undergraduate Exchange Program widen the map for prospective vandals. With $25 million in annual financial aid, bolstered by record donor giving, students are drawn to our affordable excellence. The vandal academic experience continues to shine across the state and beyond. Building upon our existing programs in over 70 locations, we now have a newly available computer science bachelor's in Coeur d'Alene, a three years Juris Doctorate in Boise, and multiple new degrees available fully online. We have expanded access to a great education. Vandals stand out in the classroom, winning prestigious scholarships and awards, learning firsthand from the best and brightest on their way to rewarding careers and great lives. Vandals are committed to service, exemplified by the hundreds of students who volunteer in our communities across Idaho and around the world. Our students excel on the field too, winning an exciting bowl game in Boise, earning Big Sky Championships in soccer, men's tennis and women's tennis, and fighting to the postseason in men's and women's basketball. Research and scholarship are at the heart of our land-grant mission. The opening of the Integrated Research and Innovation Center is a milestone for our research enterprise that has grown past 102 million in annual expenditures. Rock Creek Ranch and the Center for Agriculture, Food and the Environment present opportunities for dynamic research and partnership with industries. The U of I is positioned for lasting success. Dedicated to a diverse, inclusive environment, transparent leadership and an equitable workplace. We're investing in ourselves, ensuring that our employees are supported in their work. We're investing in our facilities, a new University of Idaho arena, a renovated medical education building, and more. The road to 2025 is paved with silver and gold. Every day, one successful student at a time, one exciting discovery after another, we push the boundaries of exploration, innovation, and achievement. Brave and bold, we are ready for what tomorrow brings. Let's give a hand to, to our University Communications and Marketing Group and the Video Production Center for that great video. 
We'll use that video in many settings, and I think it's important that we all see how we are being represented. So, one of the most important tasks of your leadership is to ensure that we have the resources to fuel our aspirations. We aspire to be an institution that holds the door open for more students, that conducts research and scholarship at the highest levels, and that makes an impact for economic prosperity and the public good here in Idaho and beyond. Achieving those goals takes resources. We cannot achieve the next level of excellence on the basis of the status quo. Therefore, I want to ensure a common understanding of where our money comes from and what we spend it on. That understanding will make clear why we must grow enrollment. As you can see on the left-hand graph, we get most of our money from five sources. State funds, I'm not very good at colors as you know, so you're gonna have to follow that yourselves. Tuition and fees, the large segment in the bottom. Research grants on the left. Sales and services, which go primarily to students in terms of residence halls and food services, and private gifts. Understanding the differences in these sources and the probable growth in them is important to understanding our resources. Now nationally, state general funds have decreased over the last 20 years, with a very sharp decrease in Idaho during the 2008 recession. I will continue to advocate for significant state investment in the University of Idaho and across higher education, but we must accept the probability of constant, perhaps even declining funding from state sources. Research grants support one of our main missions, but these restricted funds support only the purpose for which they were granted. Research grants, even those bearing our full facilities and administration right, rate, you may be surprised to hear, do not support the entire cost of research, though the value of that scholarship is undeniable and a vital part of the University of Idaho's mission. Sales and services will grow a student number, but again, this is primarily a break-even operation. Of course, educating more students is our primary mission, but tuition and fees augmented by private giving is also the piece of this pie that we can grow to fund the initiatives on which we all agree. Both educating more students and generating more tuition revenues are critical to our success. An example of an initiative that we all value is market-based compensation. Now you can see on the right-hand graph that 80% of our expenses are the salaries and benefits of the people in this room, the people who work for our university. Therefore, when we talk about market-based compensation, we are growing that largest expense sector. And as we prioritize expenditures, this investment in our people is a key to our success. I will return to enrollment later as we move through the goals in the strategic plan, but I wanna take those goals in order. So we'll start by looking at our innovate progress, and I want you to keep this slide in your mind as background. So research continues to be at the center of the University of Idaho's mission. It is the 125th anniversary of the Idaho Agricultural Experiment Station, now the research umbrella for CALS, which was born out of the Hatch Act, landmark legislation in the development of the land-grant public research university system. Before the university even started classes in 1892, we had a dairy on campus as part of the station, and you will see a return to that dairy theme later in this presentation. 2017 also marks the 100th anniversary of the College of Natural Resources. That college continues to excel with cutting edge, science-based knowledge, technology, and leadership supporting Idaho industry, and uh, uh, supporting Idaho industry, excuse me. Across the university, we've had several standout examples of individual and team success in innovation and research. Cal's researchers Greg Muller, Dan Strawn, and Martin Baker recently saw their innovative water treatment technology advance their research team to the second stage of the $10 million George Barley Water Prize, an international competition to reduce water pollution linked to toxic algae blooms. In another milestone for the university, we opened our Integrated Research and Innovation Center, or IRIC, in January 2017. One of the research programs there is the Center for Modeling Com Complex Interactions. And one of the first grants this August to that center was to Marty Yurteberg, associate professor in our physics department, and a part of the center who won a $6 million grant from the National Science Foundation. Marty's research will use computer simulations and experiments to determine how amino acid changes modify the way that proteins interact with other molecules. We also continue to build on the proud history of the Idaho Agricultural Experiment Station. In July, Jody Johnson Maynard, soil scientist in CALS, led a team that earned a $3.4 million USDA grant to explore the use of winter legumes and cover crops with cattle grazing. 
Building on findings from our REACH project, the research is a collaboration with the USDA, WSU, and Oregon State University, and an excellent example of Idaho impact for our research. Inquiry extends well beyond this bench science, however. Denise Bennett, assistant professor in the School of Journalism and Mass Media, is leading a project chronicling the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in Idaho, titled Idaho's LGBTQ Community. This project won her a $30,000 National Endowment for the Humanities grant and other financial support. And I think it's a great interdisciplinary project that connects our with our library and engages the statewide community to tell deeply meaningful stories about who we are. One important way we measure the scale of our research enterprise is through annual expenditures reported to the NSF, represented on this graph. U of I has been on the upswing, reaching $102 million for fiscal year 16, and we were proud to break that $100 million barrier last year. But today, although maybe Vice President Nelson doesn't want me to say it, I will tell you that our fiscal year 17 numbers are even higher. A new U of I record of $109.5 million in annual expenditures a very significant 7% year-over-year increase at a time when many other universities are seeing declining expenditures in a tough federal funding environment. I want to <laughs> I want to congratulate Vice President N Janet Nelson and her team for facilita facilitating this progress, but also thank the researchers who are driving that success in the colleges. Would any faculty, staff, or student engage in research and scholarship, and I'm guessing that's many of you in this room, please stand and we're gonna give you another round of applause. So if you are engaged in research. <laughs> or scholarship, thank you. Looking ahead, our strategic plan describes significant enhancements in our research enterprise with a key indicator being a ascension to R1, or highest research activity status, in the Carnegie classification. That classification has several broad indices of research activity. The aggregate index includes science and engineering research and development expenditures, as well as non-science R&D expenditures, science and engineering research staff, including postdoctoral appointees, doctorates by broad discipline area, the humanities, the social sciences, as well as the STEM fields. Carnegie also considers many of these same factors on a per faculty basis. In very rough terms, after comparing ourselves to current R1 institutions, I believe that we need to increase our research about 50% to achieve that R1 classification. Research is primarily conducted by faculty. So can we plan for a 50% increase in faculty? Remembering those budget slides, I want us all to understand that we cannot increase faculty by that number and achieve our other goals under the financial scenarios that we can reasonably anticipate. But we can achieve that increased research by effective cluster hiring, such as our College of Agriculture and Life Sciences recently affected when they hired Shirley Luckhart and Ed Lewis, recruited from UC Davis by Dean Perella. Professors Luckhart and Lewis established the Center for Health in the Human Ecosystem here at U of I. A main priority of the center will be to better understand man-made changes that can create uh, insect, uh, that can study insect-borne disease problems and find ways to prevent them. We must look for similar opportunities to optimize faculty pro productivity in all of our units. <coughs> As we look at our innovate goals and impact, I want to highlight one initiative in particular, returning to that dairy theme, the Center for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment, to be based in Southern Idaho, or the CAFE project. Thanks to Dean Perella for his leadership in this university-wide project. On the slide, you see some, some, some conceptual images, very preliminary, of such a facility. This project is important for several reasons. The Idaho economy relies heavily on dairy herds and on food processing. Livestock-based production accounts for over 60% of agricultural cash receipts in Idaho. Livestock-based agriculture is the bulk of Idaho agriculture now. In southern Idaho, dairy herds have tripled over the past 25 years. Idaho milk production varies between third and fourth nationally. Idaho food processing has grown quickly, with cheese and yogurt production led by major companies like Chobani and Glambia. I was just at a Chobani groundbreaking yesterday in Twin Falls. The Magic Valley has even been called the Silicon Valley for food innovation. This sector has enormous research potential and employment potential for our citizens, and U of I has a mission to drive that success. CAFE 
this project will be the largest and best research dairy in the U.S. I think it is critical that U of I identify areas of local importance that can have global impact. We are not simply milking cows at this facility. We are finding a way to provide protein to the world in a sustainable fashion. Current plans are for a 2,000 cow dairy relying on robotic milking machines, and we plan to have approximately 1,000 acres of associated cropland. We, we estimate this will be a $45 million project. We've been given $10 million, appropriated $10 million from the Idaho legislature last year and are likely to receive another $5 million this year. We have higher education partners in the College of Southern Idaho and in BYU-Idaho who are enthusiastic about this project. And we have recruited industry partners for this project. This is a university-wide interdisciplinary project. We need the support of all our university units to build momentum for this project. And I hope that you will, we will all see the value in this project across the university. Enhancing enrollment in post-secondary education is one of our key engagement initiatives. And you can see that we are taking multiple innovative approaches. We have 2,300 great faculty and staff and 12,000 students. Last year, we used the Vandal Ideas Project Engage, our second iteration uh, of a VIP project, calling on our entire academic community for their ideas to address important challenges. These are interdisciplinary efforts, and the VIP Engage projects include seven different pilot projects that see U of I researchers on the ground connecting with the community to impact the go-on rates from the K-12 system to higher education. One project, one example, is the Engage Pre-College Outreach Project to improve post-secondary readiness with 40 Idaho Hispanic 8th through 10th graders in Jerome, a multi-year project that integrates and enhances U of I services to address the needs of minority and rural students. I want to thank Barbara Petty, Extension Director, and Ali Carr Chelman, Dean of the College of Education, Health, and Human Sciences, and applaud, and I applaud the work of all participants in the VIP Engage program, including especially the student-led projects. If you're involved in a VIP Engage project, could you please stand and we'll recognize you. Of course, we're also continuing to partner with the State Board on Go On initiatives. This year, the State Board launched the Apply Idaho Common a Application, a one-stop application for all Idaho public post-secondary schools. We're also in the third year of our direct admissions program, and we continue to refine that process. Now, dual credit participation has been a focus of the governor and the state. Dual credit participation, as I'll describe in a moment, increased dramatically for fall 2017. The benefits of dual credit participation are multiple. Dual credit programs expand the pipeline from the K-12 system into higher education. Dual credit participation facilitates on-time graduation. Dual credit students are more prepared for their coursework and they make a positive impact on our higher education environment. There are some challenges with dual credit. The coursework can vary in rigor from setting to setting. Another challenge of dual credit is in reaching more students who might not otherwise have planned to come to college already. We are working through those challenges. Our Vandal Ideas Project Engage program, for example, may represent a, a path forward. For uh, the Becoming Brave and Bold program, led by Shauna Bertland and Aaron Doty in class, offers a dual credit transition course that enhances student self-efficacy and preparation for college, not just college credit. Looking at another engaged performance measure, economic impact, is in many ways the proof of our university's engagement with individuals, business, industry, agencies, and communities, and often is the most persuasive element in talks with external stakeholders like our legislators. Two years ago, EMSI measured that impact, pinning it at an annual $1.1 billion. Since then, we've continued to offer a great experience that leads to great jobs for our alumni, one critical piece of the economic impact, but we're also focused on direct economic devel development activities. I'm particularly pleased that we now have restructured to, to include an Office for Technology Transfer led by Director Jeremy Tansen and an Office of Economic Development led by Executive Director Jana Jones based in Boise. I want to look at a little more detail at our success in advancement. Fundraising, like tuition, is an area under our control and it provides a critical margin of excellence. It is both a measure of engagement with our alumni and community members and an important resource. Vandal donors contributed to a new record, nearly $39 million in total gifts 
this fiscal year. That generosity supports multiple pillars of Vandal excellence, and I think everyone in, in advancement and everyone who contributes to this also deserves another round of applause. More than $8 million last year fueled student scholarships. Another $8 million augmented research and faculty support. $3 million to help build and maintain top-notch facilities and nearly $19 million to support outstanding programs that help U of I excel as the state's research leader. Fundraising is an important indicator of the enthusiasm for the university's progress. So this is a strong endorsement of our position and a vote of confidence in our work. Now on the right, you see the breakdown of donors, 10,000 individual contributions from alumni, industry partners, friends of the university, faculty, staff, and parents. One story illustrates the abiding belief our alumni and friends have in this institution. This spring, the University of Idaho Foundation marked the creation of its 1500th endowment. That milestone, 1500th endowment, was established by the late Shirley A. Wentz, a lifelong Vandal supporter and dedicated educator. Originally from Caldwell, Wentz earned her bachelor's degree in education from U of I in 1971 and dedicated her career to educating young minds in the Mountain Home and Boise school districts as an elementary and kindergarten teacher. Wentz's pride in U of I and love of the Vandals didn't waver throughout her life. According to her family's report, shortly before Wentz passed away, her doctor asked her to say something to test her breathing. In what would be her last words, we are told, Wentz said, go Vandals. <laughs> a powerful testament to her vandal experience. But more importantly, Shirley's endowment will help future educators enjoy the rewards she received from introducing young readers to the power of books and reading. Endowments like this are invested over the long term to support students, faculty, research, and university programs. The 1,500 endowments amount to more than $300 million that last year provided $10.2 million to the university in scholarship and program support. And a, hundred, and, a, and a total from our endowment of $165 million distributed since 1959. That endowment is very literally an investment in the bright futures of Idaho's young people. We are very grateful for it and for all the other support of the University of Idaho Foundation. Looking ahead, we're thinking about our upcoming capital campaign. Again, today I'm talking to you very realistically, and realistically, what might that campaign bring to U of I? I think in facilities, we can probably target about $100 million in new facilities. Our ARENA project, originally estimated at $30 million, we now have a much firmer idea from our architectural renderings, will be closer to $45 million. The Center for Agriculture, Food, and Environment, CAFE, will require another $15 million or so. I believe we can raise about another $40 to $50 million for one academic building. Current gifts over the next several years can result in approximately another $100 million to support the university. And I believe we can probably add $100 million to our endowment over this time. If we do add $100 million to the endowment, it would bring the total endowment from $300 million to $400 million, resulting in about an additional $4 million per year in income, much of which would support scholarships and faculty excellence, including endowed chairs and professorships. Right now, our administration, especially Vice President McFadden and Provost Winsack and our deans, are in the study and planning stages of that campaign. So these are just broad possible outcomes. But we've already begun a major fundraising effort that will complement the growth strategies at the university and our ability to deliver education, scholarship, and programmatic excellence. <laughs> so if enrollment is at the center of our target, how are we doing? This is the second consecutive year we've had an enrollment increase in terms of headcount. You can see some of the specific points of success on this slide. Increases in international students, increases in dual credit participants, and a dramatic increase in our first to second year retention rate, and more. Those increases are in the face of national trends that are going the other direction. As the economy has improved and people work more readily coming right out of high school or with a certificate. You hear me say this often, but even with an economy that offers employment directly from high school, a college degree is the best bet for a great life and for an engaged citizenry. Multiple statistical studies bear this out. Our task is to help our citizens understand this important issue. We have built on our enrollment success of last year with an increase in retention. Our first to second year retention rate has gone from 77% to 82% this fall, a leadership position among public institutions in the state. 
This is due to the coordinated efforts across all of the colleges and especially our strategic enrollment management offices. Thank you to the advisors, faculty, associate deans, and students for helping us realize this significant improvement. Looking forward, our Vandal Student Success Initiative will contribute to, student, to enhance student success from recruitment through career. We're also investing in technologies like the Starfish platform, called Vandal Star by the Associated Students of U of I, that will help our staff support students at scale. We've recently made a move to centralize some key services like recruitment and, and advising. I know that those moves have caused some concern, but we must come together to work them out. Students have been very interested in centralizing services, and this tells me that they see this as a positive move, and I know it is a best practice that we must embrace. We have to take also the optimistic view on our college-going landscape in Idaho. We have multiple areas of, opportunities in which, uh, of opportunity in which to foster growth. We have an untapped traditional college-age population. Probably at or about 48% of our students this year, our high school graduates, will go on to post-secondary education. In Idaho, we often hear about being the last or near the bottom in those rankings, but we are better served, I believe, to look at that glass as being half full and embrace the opportunity to reach the other half of our state's graduating high school students who need a great education. There is no shortage of young women and men in Idaho who are qualified to attend and to succeed at our institution. We have a significant unserved, un non-traditional, largely distance population as well. The largest segment of our adult population has some college but no degree. How can we bring these people back into higher education and provide a path to enhance career and personal success. We also continue to seek out and value international students, and we made progress this year with our Navitas partnership, the Global Student Success Program. The first cohort of GSSP students arrived, um, arrived on campus this fall um, and, and, uh, and are doing great. I wanna look in somewhat more detail at how we bring more people into higher education and how we continue to deliver a life-changing educational experience. We're continuing to enhance our recruitment approaches. Dean Kaler and his team are working hard at things like expanding and improving our Envision events and our Meet the Vandals events. Recruitment staff are armed with more concrete information describing the academic excellence of our programs. We're continuing our aggressive implementation of the Direct Admit and Apply Idaho programs. We've also re-expanded our Western Undergraduate Exch Exchange program to the states of Washington, Oregon, and now Alaska. These are states where we felt we could be competitive with respect to their in-state tuition. Several years ago, we needed to get WUI under control, but that pendulum may have swung a little too far in the direction of being too conservative in our tuition discounting, and we're swinging that pendulum back slowly. Located in the College of Education building, the recently established Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning offers a centralized location for faculty and instructors to explore new te technology build their existing skills, and collaborate with other instructors. This approach leverages our internal expertise to help our people grow and thrive and contribute to the success of university goals and to our students. I'm looking forward to seeing our center excel in that mission. We're also focused on curricular development that meets the expectations of students and the demand of the marketplace. Our medical sciences degree is an example of meeting a need. We found that we can offer a clearer pathway toward medical education and related fields. I was also encouraged to see a new program out of our College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences, the radio, television production degree, and I know that CLASS has also put together a number of fully online programs uh, to, to reach that non-traditional population. We're also excited about our computer science degree in Coeur d'Alene with its new home in the Innovation Den downtown. That region is seeing strong growth in technology-driven careers, so this meets that need. Thanks to Charles Buck and Dean Larry Stauffer for their leadership. We want to tap our U of I community's expertise again this year. <coughs> and so today, I'm announcing our next Vandal Ideas project, Transform. For fiscal year 19, we will focus on the transformative education offered at U of I. I've asked Vice Provost Cher Hendricks and Dean Ginger Carney to lead this project, but I expect our entire campus, students, faculty, and staff, to participate and to get behind this initiative. We have almost 15,000 people here. There's a huge reservoir of great ideas and talents. We need to tap into that reservoir. Expect to see more details and information coming very soon. 
As part of our commitment to, val to cultivating a valued and diverse community, I want to note a couple key areas of progress. First, we should be aware of enrollment gains in international students, up 7.3%. These students help diversify our community and internationalize our campus. I want to also highlight gains in other aspects of diversity. We've seen some key increases among Hispanic and Native American students. U of I, as a public land grant, should aspire to be a cross-section of Idaho and serve all the people of Idaho. We continue to work with our, through our Latino Advisory Council to serve the Hispanic population. The President's Diversity Council has also been an invaluable partner in serving our diverse student, faculty, and staff. We're focused on our tribal relationships as well and just concluded a summit with our 10 MOU tribal partners this week. And you can see some beautiful new artwork that we revealed uh, yesterday or the day before. I've lost track of time, sorry. Um, we're also focused on internal improvements for our, for our own community. Market-based compensation, facilitated in part by program prioritization, has not been an easy process. And we owe thank you to Human Resources Director Wes Matthews, Provost Winsack, and the Staff Council and Faculty Sem Senate Committees for shepherding that work through. The equitable compensation is critical to all of us. We recently released our Great Colleges to Workforce survey results with a slight overall improvement this year. I think that gaining confidence in process and in progress will take multiple years, but we are committed to serving our people better and we will see results. Yolanda Bisbee, Executive Director of Equity and Diversity, has agreed to lead a work group that will develop a cascaded plan to define key actions to improve workplace satisfaction for our faculty and staff across the state. I want to thank all the work group members that she's identified. In addition to Yolanda, we have Patrick Herdlicka, Patricia Baker, Rula Awad Rafferty, and Ro Afacho. We really appreciate your service. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Looking ahead at this goal, we have to make continued steady progress on market-based compensation. And I think that we must have that driven by enrollment growth rather than reallocation. You may be asking, how do we reach 50% more students with only perhaps 10% more faculty? We need to look at some thoughtful changes in the professorate. Provost Winsack has had initial conversations with Faculty Senate on issues of differentiation in the professorate, with perhaps more flexible distribution of effort for our tenured faculty, and perhaps an expanded teaching track to increase our reach. Having moved through our strategic plan, let's step back and review. The excellence of our university is predicated on enrollment and research growth. We can serve more students and contribute to their success and to the prosperity of our world, worthy goals in and of themselves, while generating the resources that we need to move to the next levels of excellence. We must return to our budget to understand how our future is within our control. In brief, in theory, U of I could remain at about 12,000 students, receive small inflationary increases in tuition and in state appropriations, and continue at our current compensation rates, about 80% of market rates for staff. In another scenario, U of I could pay competitive salaries and still serve about 12,000 students, but that would necessitate faculty and staff contraction by about 20%. In this scenario, I believe we'd also risk severe increasing competition in all of our missions from some of our other uh, sister universities. <laughs> I don't think either of those scenarios are what we want. Alternately, I believe that we can grow by about 50% in research and in student number, fueling much of our growth on net tuition revenue. In that scenario, we can afford market compensation, understanding that we must limit faculty and staff growth to about 10%. This approach requires focus and efficiency in all of our missions, and especially in education and in research. That is the road forward, I believe, to becoming a better, stronger institution, remaining Idaho's premier research university, and joining the ranks of Carnegie R1 peers. And that, I believe, is the road we should take. So what are their key tasks for 2017 and 2018? Every person in this audience has a critical role to play in a future that starts right now with important tasks for 2017, 2018. Some of these tasks will be ongoing, but we must tackle these this year to make the progress we need to reach our objectives for 2025. And I recognize that our plate is very full. Enrollment, not just recruitment, but retention through a great educational experience that continues from recruitment through graduation must remain the center of our target. We have to stay focused also 
on the internal progress that we want to make. Market-based compensation has been a difficult process, and this year was funded by a challenging program prioritization effort. We are in the midst of refreshing the U of I brand, carefully crafting a refined visual and messaging approach to telling the story of our outstanding university. We have key projects. I mentioned CAFE, but the ARENA project remains a top priority. With more complete design estimates in hand, we understand that this is likely approximately a $45 million project. We are going to continue to fundraise over the next year and a half for that project, and I am confident of success. U of I deserves an outstanding facility, one that appropriately reflects the excellence of our university and one that highlights sustainable Idaho industri industry. One of our alums asked me about the renderings on that. Are they stunning? And I think the University of Idaho deserves stunning. <laughs> You'll hear that again in multiple contexts. Stunning. <laughs> so our story and our values are rich. We're exploring a new way to tell that story, our story, the story of a university whose proud history informs a bright future. Honoring our 128-year history, we're revitalizing our brand to tell the story of a university committed to taking on new challenges stronger than ever. What is this Vandal story? How do we stay true to our mission while adapting and evolving? What do we tell people about our great institution? I think we start with who we are. At the University of Idaho, we are explorers. We're also a university and community that is, I hope Brian's doing this about the right time. <coughs> we are also a university and community that is inclusive, authentic, curious, confident, agile, innovative, open, and intelligent. And you take all of these strengths together, we are leaders, remaining true to our mission, but adapting and evolving to face the challenges of today and the goals of our institution. Let's renew our belief in our leadership position. Let's tell our story to Idaho and to the world. Let's infuse that spirit of leadership into our classrooms, our offices, our laboratories, and all of our endeavors as vandals. Be excited about the story of this university. We have made great progress, and we are positioned to lead the way in education, research, and engagement for years to come. So I want to thank all of you for leading in that work. Our progress has been and will continue to be a university-wide effort. Go Vandals. So at this time, I'd like to take any questions from faculty, staff, and students, and we'll defer media questions to a little bit later. We've set aside time in the chief's room for any media uh, representatives who are here, and I'll address your questions in that, in that setting. So any questions? Thank you, Pre President Staben. My name is Sarah Nelson. I'm in Modern Languages and Cultures. I teach French. Um, and I appreciated that talk very much as motivating. Um, I also well, that's appreciated. Good. Yes, <laughs> it was supposed to be motivating. <laughs> right, um, and I also appreciated the the uh, statement you started with about your recent candidacy at another university. Um, I know you don't want to dwell on it, but it is a matter of some concern for all of us to know whether we've got a big presidential search coming soon in our in our future. And so I wonder if you'd be willing to talk at all about what has made you change your mind from the statements that you made when you first came to UI that you planted to stay for at least 10 years and whether your mind has changed Well, I, I don't forward. think it's, it's really that valuable to speculate on that. I think today what we really need to do is focus on the university, focus on the progress that we made, and focus on the future. Is there another question? Should have planted some folks. Sarah has another question. <laughs> My other question was um, that you you said we needed to cap at 10% faculty. And I noticed that you said faculty and staff growth, and I'm wondering if we could commit to capping administrative growth to maybe around zero percent. <laughs> well, 
administrators are staff. I, I don't think we need to, you know, I don't think we need to grow uh, at the administrative upper levels very much. We have a great team of folks uh, on our on our administrative cabinet, for example. So I don't see growth there probably. Uh, and of course, the 10% figure is an, is an estimate, Sarah, over roughly the next eight years. It looks like there's a question over here, and there may be questions from some of our other sites. Um, uh, it's hard for me to note those, but I'm sure somebody will bring them to our attention. Hi, Mary Kay McFadden from Advancement. Um, President Stabin, I just wonder if you could talk to us about, uh, we understand the role of the research university, the premier research university in the state of Idaho, but I don't necessarily get the sense that the entire state of Idaho actually appreciates what a wonderful resource, and, and also maybe uh, the service and contribution that, that we make towards industry and all of that. And I wonder if you could talk about that in terms of what you think we need to do so that uh, we're in stronger partnership with industry throughout the state and, and just in terms of our role as the research university. Well, you know, a research university is not simply piling up research dollars. It's really about infusing inquiry and research into everything that we do. And therefore, we provide, frankly, the best education in Idaho. We do provide expertise all across Idaho. I think we haven't been as aggressive as we could be in ensuring that that word gets out. And I want your help in ensuring that that word gets out to your friends and neighbors, as well as any of the constituents that you have. Um, Certainly that's a role for the president to take on wholeheartedly. It is something that I try to do as much as possible to tell our story and make, make clear that story. But we really are a beacon for mountain and plain. That's what we are. And we don't want to always hearken back to the, to the past. You saw a little less of the past in this presentation. We want to go forward. And a great research university is an engine that drives a state forward, and we are that great research university. And we need to tell absolutely everyone in the state that that is an important, valuable, precious thing. So I don't know if I addressed your question, Mary Kay. I did not, by the way, plant that question. That first question sort of put a damper on the whole. <laughs> There's a question over here. I think Jeremy has a question. Uh, with increases in enrollment being such an important part of this new plan <coughs> for our growth, uh, can you preview for us some of the initiatives that might be coming out of the newly uh, consolidated efforts for enrollment uh, management? You know, that might, I, I would be happy to give a shot at that, but that might be better done by either Provost Winsack or Dean Kaler. Who wants to wrestle, arm wrestle and answer that question? Dean, can you, I think this one's live, or that one's live. Yeah, Dean always wears a tie, and I finally convinced him to go casual today, and now he has to get up and... And, and speak. What did you know? The first day, that, I think that's the first day I've not worn a tie. Um, so we have a lot of really uh, good things going on across the campus and around the state. Um, we have an exceptional uh, leadership team uh, in the admissions office. Um, Bobby Gary is with us from uh, University on the East Coast, and she's doing great things to lead our, our team forward. Michael Sanders um, uh, is uh, working very hard with the recruiters. Our recruiters are um, exceptionally well trained. Always room for improvement on that, but they're going out with really, really great um, brag points and uh, differentiation points about why this institution is an exceptional buy for our prospective students. And um, our UCM team has done a great job of pr providing materials to us. If you haven't seen the um, the family look and feel of the publications that are going out, um, both electronically and uh, the hard copy pieces, then um, you, you need to take a look at those because uh, they've done a really great job and, and my thanks to UCM for doing that. We um, are implementing uh, currently uh, 
the CRM, uh, we, we've had a glitch with our CRM, but we are using it um, in a lot of different ways to reach out to prospective students. And that's something that um, is, is coming along. We think that we can do even better with that, and we look forward to great progress on that. Um, but we're communicating to students in a variety of ways. Um, we purchase names from um, deeper into the enrollment funnel, and so we're trying to reach out to students with messages earlier in their high school years. Uh, we are reaching out geographically, um, I think a little bit more widely than we were perhaps in the past. Uh, we are also um, using, uh, implementing a telecounseling initiative. Uh, Bobby just shared with me this morning that uh, we are very close to implementing that, which means that we'll have a crew of um, currently enrolled students who are ambassadors who are reaching out to kind of near peer um, age groups and uh, helping to reach out, answer questions to those students, inviting them to events, helping them navigate the process to go on to college. And so I think that um, those are just a few of the examples of things that we're doing. I don't know if I've missed anything major. I, we've got, there's a, there's a ton of things going on and to stand in front of you and recall them you know, from memory, I'm sure I've missed many of them. Our Go On program, uh, we have uh, three ambassadors, I'm um, sorry, staff that are embedded in high schools down in the Boise area who are uh, really doing some neat things and working with those schools uh, uh, and, and counseling students on um, going on to college, not just necessarily for the University of Idaho, but we are in it for the state and we're in it for our students across the state. And so um, I think that we'll see some real results from that also. But um, our Meet the Vandals events, we've reorganized uh, those and uh, revamped them a bit. Instead of doing um, uh, a small number and uh, doing it with a fairly high price tag, we're actually um, spreading that out and doing many more of those. We're going into neighborhoods, going to where the students are um, with smaller uh, events that don't cost as much. That means a lot allows us to be able to do more. And um, we're seeing good results from those on, on many of them. There's a couple of them. We, we tried some new things, and they didn't work quite the way that we had hoped. Um, but you've got to take risks in order to see returns. And so um, those are just some you know, real brief examples of things that we're doing. I would be happy to sit and talk with anybody who wants to visit with me or with Bobby about the recruitment efforts and what's going on out there. And on the retention side, Cynthia Castro, I don't know where you are, Cynthia, but uh, she would probably be also willing to sit down and talk about retention initiatives that are going um, on from that side of the shop. So hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. No, I don't need one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. Other questions? There's one over there. Hello, Roger Rowley, Director Hi. of University Galleries. Uh, you spoke about the uh, need for additional funds, research funds, to uh, reach R1. Um, and I'm wondering, if you look at uh, R1 universities, how do they compare in terms of percentage of effort of faculty towards research, how that may impact our teaching capacity, uh, the size of our graduate, postgraduate population as to where it is now and what it would have to be to reach those R1 uh, goals. Sure, so w we have done some looking at that. Uh, first of all, of course, R1 status is not all about research funds. I just want to reemphasize that there are a number of other aspects to attaining that status, but that is an important part of that. Um, yes, it requires significant faculty effort. I don't think remarkably different from what we do at the university. We may require some differentiation of effort with respect to, to research effort versus other efforts that our faculty apply. And what I, what I wanna really leave the message of is that every faculty member can contribute, every, every staff member can contribute, but we need to think about the ways we can best contribute to the university. What is the best and highest use of our time and the most impactful use of our time? Some people that will probably be a little bit more research activity, and some people it may be a little bit less of research activity. But yes, we have looked at that, Roger. Other questions? There's one back here, Rula has a question, and Shauna has a question, maybe after that. Um, thank you for um, the State of the University address. I have a question about you know, you talked about um, efforts to recruit and retain students. What about efforts to recruit and retain faculty and staff, especially the retention component? Sure, so um, uh, we think those are probably a little bit different, faculty and staff recruitment and retention. So I may take those a little bit independently. 
Um, on the faculty side, I think that faculty are really primarily attracted by opportunity. The opportunity to have great colleagues, to have adequate or, or excellent facilities, and the opportunity to pursue their research and scholarship interests, opportunity to work with students who will challenge them. And I think we offer a great, uh, you know, great opportunities in, in, in those areas. I think on the staff side at the moment, one of our key challenges is that our compensation is not actually close to market. And I think on the retention side in particular, to some extent on the recruitment side, um, that has been a challenge for the university for probably many years, or at least several years. And the market-based compensation initiative will address that in part. Now, I've said many times in this forum and others that I do not think that money is actually the key motivator of faculty or staff. But I do think that on especially the retention side, if you pay people uh, inadequately, uh, other factors become obvious to them, and they begin to look around and they begin to leave. And that can be a problem. Shauna had a question, still has a question. Well, actually, I don't have a question, but I just want to give a shout out to um, the Marcom Group and Creative Services and the incredible branding that we have for this university. And, you know, for the past three days, I have been on MSN and I have seen banner ads and square ads, and it's exciting. So, kudos to everybody who did that. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause then. By the way, many people in the room have probably seen that we are changing some of our branding and, and some of the visual messages. And I just want to point out that as the colorblind person, I did not make any of the color decisions. So, uh, but, the, but the marketing group has done a great job. Thanks. Yeah, question up here. And I prefer color challenge to colorblind, by the way. Thank you, this is David Summers of ITS. Um, we've heard here and in other places that it's crucial that everybody does their part to help increase enrollment and the dollar certainly helps us, the dollar figure certainly helps us see the importance of that. Um, I, I wonder if a lot of people like me are wondering what we can do to do that. And I, the answer can't be, I, I, I I don't want an answer. I, I don't think it'd be the same for me as it would be for a faculty member or anybody else. But is there something that, is there an initiative or something else that can be done to help trickle down that information or that encouragement to all of us workers to um, help us understand what we can do to help increase enrollment? Sure. David, I, I'm not sure I can give you the complete answer, but let me try to address that. So first off, uh, let's just think from the perspective of a prospective student or a, a family. Literally, when they come on this campus, everything they see will speak to them. And, and, and that extends from their, their impressions as they drive to this campus and they find their way to the university, where they park, okay? And whether they encounter a, a campus that looks good, doesn't have garbage out on it, et cetera, those kinds of things, the welcome they receive at, at the Welcome Center, the program that they, that, they, that they see. Whether or not they have a frustrating or positive experience as they interact with our online materials. A lot of our uh, materials are now online, of course, the applications and all of those kinds of things. Whether when they come here as students, and I'm kind of focusing a little bit on you as an IT uh, person, but you know, when they come here, uh, are the systems that they have to use ones that are designed, frankly, for the benefit of the IT group or the benefit of the student, okay? So I want you, as an IT person, to be thinking about, does this help that faculty member in the classroom do their job better? Does this help that student interact better with his or her email system, his or her Blackboard account, those kinds of things? What can I do? And I don't know exactly what, I see you around all the time, David, but I don't really know exactly what you do, I apologize. But, um, but, um, but, you know, how, how can I help that? So whether you're in desktop support at ITS and you're helping that faculty member who reduces their frustration because, gosh, I'm doing a great job of supporting them on their desktop, or whether you're the person who's actually making that starfish system sing for uh, our students and for our faculty, I think it's pretty clear that ITS can be a huge player in the success of our students, of our faculty, of our staff, and of our mission. 
there's a question here. Can you wait just a moment, Kelly? Hi, Kelly O'Neill, Theater Arts. Um, thank you for ITS and the way it's been um, remodeled. We've had a lot of success with uh, connecting directly with our two IT guys, and they've been a big help, so really like that. Um, we should probably thank Dan Ewart and his crew for that, but yeah. as opposed to me, but <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm sure you know Wazoo recently announced that they're cutting their performing arts program, and so I wondered if you can talk a little bit about your commitment to the creative arts and creative research here on campus. Yes, uh, so uh, we, we did notice that. In fact, even extended an offer to, to WSU to help them as they transition some of their program. But we have a pretty strong commitment to the performing arts on this campus, and I see no reason we wouldn't continue that. Uh, arts and humanities are literally, I'm reminded by the dean sitting behind you, Andy Kirsten, often what makes us human, and we need to remember that. So I think we have a strong commitment to the arts and to the humanities and to many other disciplines on campus, but I, I see no reason we wouldn't do that. We, Mary Beth and I uh, just enjoyed a wonderful evening at the, the dance program. Uh, I've forgotten the title and I probably shouldn't have. But, um, but those are things that are, are, are very valuable to our campus, to our students. So thank you for your efforts in that area. Any other questions, comments? You can thank the IT group again or whatever. So. <laughs> One of my uh, weakest points is keeping track of time. Isn't that right, dear? And uh, so, uh, so it's about 3 o'clock, and I don't want to keep people much longer, but if there is maybe one more question, somebody must have one more question, and then we can all... Look, George has a question. Yeah. So I'm George Tanner, uh, College of Business Economics. I've always had a, an idea in my head who, we, who our peers are at the level we're at. As we move up, if, if we get to the R1 status, who are those schools that we compare ourselves to? And the second part is, is will the state of Idaho and will the students that we're trying to attract, will that shift from, from one level to the next really resonate with the people that we want on campus? Or how does it resonate? How do you sell that? So, uh, good question. So, the first question about our peers, you know, I, uh, I can't stand here and enumerate our peers. I might pick on somebody like Dale Petrack to do that if you really want to know. But, but we actually have looked at both our current peers and we have a defined set, roughly 20 universities to which we do compare ourselves. And sort of that next set of R1 universities, and in fact have done, uh, over a number of years, Bob Smith was very involved in some comparisons of our university to sort of the R1 aspirant universities that are near us in terms of, of research expenditures and other characteristics. So we certainly do have those peer sets and we can, we can dive into that in a little greater detail. In terms of, of students and the people of Idaho, uh, I think your question is not unlike an earlier one about do the people of Idaho, do the students really recognize what they have? And, and I think many do, frankly, uh, but we need to ensure that they all do. This, this is a great research university and again, it's that spirit of inquiry that, it, that permeates our university. You want to come here because you will learn best from the best. And that's what we have is the best faculty and I think the best overall student experience in Idaho. And this is a great place to come. Not everybody can or will come here, but I think if we tell our story effectively and we maintain that sort of, of excellence and maintain good value, people will recognize that, but it is incumbent upon us to tell that story as effectively as possible. And I think that's what most businesses, we're not a business, but that is what most businesses would, would tell us is an important thing to learn from them. Okay, I said one last question and I think that might have been it. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you for uh, the great work that you do on behalf of the University of Idaho. And uh, I know there's a few more cookies out there, so please eat those and, uh, and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Appreciate it.